Everybody said there's two world wars, right? Everybody? No, there wasn't. There was two European wars. And what they found is they wrote in their colonies, right, to be part of their fighting machine in order for them to win. But it, was, it had nothing to do with us. And the, main, the only thing that it did have to do with us is they were fighting over who took the biggest parts of Africa. Does that make sense? Now this is the point. Um, the Dutch don't like the German. The German don't like the Swiss. The Swiss don't like the French. The French don't like the English. And the English don't like anybody. <laughs> but you see when it comes to dealing with us, they put all of them titles away all of them country names away. They are no longer Dutch, English, French, and all the rest of it. They become one white people. They deal with us, and then they go back to hating each other. When there was empires in Africa called Kush, Timbuktu, where every race came to get books for my success. Peace and love, black family. This is the Prince of Pan-Africanism, Dr. Umar Johnson, and I support 100% GKTV. That's right. God. Kush TV for the latest conscious information, trending news, and information that you can use. Make sure you check out Got Kush TV. GK TV, they got that information you need. Africa with a C or a K. Stop debating what we should wear weave or have an Afro. 
where we're from south or north, we can do this. It just takes us to take action, come together, have your camera, have your microphone and, and do something. Because we're not into the long talking no more, the talking done now. We must start taking action. So that is the Got Kush TV Black Group Economic Show. Because we're trying to do and show what we can do over here. We're not on this what the white man did to us tip. We're on the what the black people can do for ourselves. That's the main thing that you're going to take away from today. What we can start to do for ourselves in England. So hopefully you get inspiration by the documentary that we're going to show after. And then we can talk about how does that relate to us over here. And how can that inspire us to take action over here. Are you ready? Good? Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put, turn off the lights, I'm going to start the film. And then afterwards we'll have a Q&A session. So enjoy the documentary. Thank you for listening. motivations um, why I do the work that I do. As you, I'm a mother of three, my, all my children are under the age of 10. Now when you're on this journey and I'm coming from a youth work background, working with so so called these young, so ghetto youth, bad breed children, all the labels that they give these children, nobody doesn't want to spend time with them. Now if the, the future is not right for us as big people as well as young people, if we need to take responsibility for what our future looks like. No one is going to um, map out our future but ourselves. Um, one of, I was speaking to one of my friends the other day, the youth club where I learned computer skills, youth, basic youth, where all my general skills that led me on to doing this work, they're going to turn it, they're knocking it down and turn it into flats. Now, if there's no responsible young, um, responsible adults as a youth worker looking out for our young people, when the young people get into trouble, who do they end up interacting with? with the police. Then they go in the criminal justice system. Sometimes they go in there and get caught up in the system, come out even worse. And then what happens then? I, we lose our young people. Now, what are we going to do as responsible adults and big people in this room to create a better future for our young people? I'm glad that your parents left a, a asset for you that you can use today. But what are we doing here? As in, in England, to do that? How are we gonna replicate that? So all parents are thinking that way. Because when we did the Black um, Gold Financial Literacy Programme, it was a struggle to get our people to engage. And I'm like, but hold up. You need to bring, we need to arm our children with financial literacy. Because when our young people go out, they think, oh, they can get a mobile phone, not realising that that's your credit history. And when your credit history is bad in this, in this society, you can't do anything. How does that impact on you? Speaking to some of the young people about just basics in terms of, okay, what does your parents pay? What bills are they paying? They haven't got a clue because their parents are not talking to their young people. My dad, he made it blatant. Oh, my dad, I want this. No, 
Why can't I have that? Because I've got this bill, that bill, this bill to pay. Light bill don't pay by itself. Yeah, you like to eat, so you need to find the food to all these things. He was telling me what I have to go through. I watched him do basic budgeting. I watched him go to work, cough up his lungs and still leave the house and go to work. Our parents, and a lot of us in this room are probably suffering with high blood pressure, hypertension, um, going to work with people that you don't want to be working. It's only because they got their mortgage to pay and thinking, you know what, if I don't have my mortgage, you'll be dead now. These are things that we're going through. Tribunal cases, being um, being suspended at work. We're going through this in the community, but we're suffering in silence. We're not communicating with each other. We can't take our pe our employer to employment tribunal because you need at least five grand before they even see your case. They're making it even harder for you now. And the whole reason why Black Issue Study started is because of a employment tribunal case. Mark took the Department of Slave, sorry, Department of Trade and Industry <laughs> to employment tribunal and won. And that's what we reinvested the money that he got from the tribunal case into Black Issue Study. Or we will not be sitting here. So we got to be looking at how do we support each other. I know Wayne, we have many conversations about teaching our children in terms of financial literacy. I know our children won't be um, hanging outside or, or outside the shops um, <laughs> in a no. line to no. get I shut children's. No. No. But you can see that happens. Well... The thing with um, children now, because my son's 16. Mm. Yeah, he's 16. Mm. And I'm going to say, just get that out of the way now. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> my son is 16, and um, he's actually just got a job recently, yeah. and I wanted him to do it on purpose because he's working in McDonald's at the moment. That's worse. But though. he actually, ha but it's yeah. different because he actually has to bid for his hours. Wow. So if he wants to do a shift, he has to go online and he has to bid for the hours before he gets it. He's been working there for about three weeks, he's only done two shifts. It's Saturday today, isn't it? Yeah. Today's his second shift. So, I mean, when it happened, I wasn't surprised, because I looked at him, and I said, oh, you got a zero hour contract, haven't you? And he said, yeah, how do you know? I said, yeah, that's what your dad was doing years and years before. And I said, now you're gonna learn. Now, it's not a big deal, because I've been in business myself for a period of time where he can eventually take over, because he's doing accounting. But what I tried to explain to him and other people even older than him and older than myself is this day was always going to come yeah. because the country that we live in, they're greed, it's greedy basically. They're running out of ways to make money. A lot of people here, they don't produce stuff. They outsource everything. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of lost the skill of making stuff from the beginning. Now, the advantage that we have is that we are creative people. Yes. There's loads of events, like, you know, the rites of passage um, thing that you mentioned, but there's loads of other people that I've discovered upon, upon my journey. The only thing that's missing is the fact that a lot of us aren't linked. Yeah. So we'll have an event on one day, and then someone else is having an event on the same day, because you two don't talk. Yeah. And you don't talk. I don't know why, but you don't. So it would be good if we could have someone that does some kind of networking with all of these people to find out, okay, what are you doing this day? What are you doing that day? And then some kind of newsletter goes out to show everyone where everyone's gonna be. Because one of the most frustrating things I have is that if I'm going to an event and I find out I've missed someone else's, because I wanna go to all of them, but we're not, there's no cohesion. So we've got a lot of talent and people doing their thing, but they're not, you know, it's, it's almost like you've got, you've got Sunday dinner at Granny's house. But Granny's not there no more. And we all want that food, but we don't even know. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's like we've got one cousin living in Sydenham, one cousin living in Fulton Heath, one living in Harlesden, and we don't know what's going on. And then we all get caught up in our jobs, and then before you know it, years go by, and then we're like, how do we get here? Because there's no central hub anymore. Yeah. You know, so that's the thing that we're missing. So I'm glad that we've got all these black businesses here, but sometimes I find that even myself, I'm doing more than I should because I'm thinking, I've got my own business to run, but it's like I'm trying to make sure that this business and that one's running together. It's like, oh, you do natural hair. Well, guess what? They've just made their own brand of, I don't know, some cream or something. They should be in the same place, but they don't even know each other. So I think it's just a cohesion thing. To go back to what you said as well, how different it is in America. In America, they've got, they've got a really big media machine behind them. Whereas over here, we still just got social media. If they took off our Facebook and our Twitters now, I don't know where some of us would be, yeah. you know? So I think what we need to kind of focus on is kind of just being in each other's business. So if someone's got an event this day, it's for you to be responsible and find out what else is going on so that other things don't clash with it. Yeah. And then we can get, you know, we can work together. 
And then, you know, you could even do something petty like, if you go to a Black History Studies event, you get one pound off of one of my books or something. And then, you know, you get that kind of cohesion. So it's just working together, really. This goes back to that common com community, because we have that debate, there's no black community. There's common unity. That's why I started the event with the meet and greet, because how can we talk about nation building, starting business and supporting each other if we can't even turn around and say hello to each other? We're not talking to each other. We don't even want to smile with each other. We can't get anywhere in terms of some of the solutions that were being talked about in the film, unless we're communicating in a productive way in the community. And we do have a community, but we're not working as an effective common, in a common unity. That's why I always say to people, I don't care if you've got the biggest weave, blonde hair, you're, you're not got an African name, you don't recognise yourself as black or African, and all these isms and schisms and differences, I embrace everybody. We've got to put them things aside and stop the foolishness and come and work together. Yeah, you don't have to like each other. Yeah, because other communities don't like each other, but they say, you know what, we need to work together. Yeah, we've got some common goal, focus on that, and then we can go back to hating each other. But when it comes to dealing with us, we need to come together and stop the nonsense. And that's and that's where we have our power. We have strengths in power. We, we, we've had liberation movements in this country. We've got things changed in this country because we work together. We can go back to that. There's nothing stopping us from going back to that situation. I'm going to come to Sister here. Can I, so before the next, do you mind, can you yeah. add to the conversation? Um, at the beginning of the the um, the film, um, I think there was a statement that we must return to the past to move forward, mm -hmm. and I believe in that statement wholeheartedly. And one of the things, actually, one of the things I'm I'm quite proud about today is there's a lot of young people in the audience. Yes. To be honest, yes. and <laughs> sometimes I speak to youngsters and it's like, well, it, it doesn't come always come easy. You have to work hard for it. But I, I feel that sometimes our parents kind of spoilt us in terms of some of the realities of life. And I think, you know, going back to the past, there's a lot to learn to pass on to the youngsters today. We're in another time right now. I'm talking to young people right now. And, but it's, it's, it's a time of hardship. I mean, we, there's key things happening right now, like the EU referendum and so forth. We need to think about how is that going to affect us? And as the sister at the back said, we don't know, some of us are living in, in stress and anxiety for, in terms of our future. We can't change the past, we can learn from the past, but we can control the future. And that's why we have to instill those values into our youngsters right now. Don't be afraid to talk to your children, tell them the realities of life. Give them the foundation to support them to move forward. We've got to do that. Firstly, should we as black organizations have to go to white European corporations to fund our work? We, like, we have enough income in our community to fund our own things first. But the thing is, it's just getting our people to be willing to give that money. So, for example, and if when we do, we've got to go over the men. We have to get past the mentality of our people. If, example, Dr. Umar Johnson. Anybody on social media? He's trying to open up a school in America. Yeah, and I don't know what our people think that you just get this money and the school and the poof, the school come out of nowhere. It's gonna take time. So, but I'm like, okay, he's opening up a school, he's trying to do his thing, it's cool, let's support the mother. But the amount of negativities, people are breaking it down. Oh, because he said that he's got a blood relative of friend. So what? I've got a blood relative of Marcus Garvey, but look at the work I'm doing. And we we tear each other down. Why is that? We must support, we're quick to tear down. Also, you mentioned about going to say, various corporates and mention music. It's not black America that's promoting those music. It's white America promoting the music on a specific image of what we're doing. Because I know there's conscious artists out there with conscious rap and music, but we're never ever going to hear of. But we hear what, what, what Rihanna dancing naked because that promotes an image. And it goes back to Got Push TV in terms of who controls the media, what do they choose to put out there. So, for example, we've had many brilliant singers in this country that should be international, but because, because they don't fit a certain view or they don't look a certain way, we don't tend to see them again. So where's Terry Walker? Brilliant singer, but we don't see her again. Uh, Flirty Lara, 
brilliant singer, but we don't see her again because she doesn't um, have the stick freak size, eight size, six figure. And she don't get to see these artists, but who is promoting them? They have to go. She could have won um, X Factor, what's it called? The Voice many a times, but the thing is, because she doesn't fit that mold, where is she now? And it goes back to creative industries. You, um, Wayne does creative industries, and go back to the film when they talk about cultural appropriation and taking our stuff. A lot of these big corporates will like what you do, mm -hmm. and then take it and buy it out, and you never get to see it again. Moonlots is an example of that.
Greetings. Hi, I'm Sister Lejet. I do the African language classes and this is the motto that I have. He who does not know can know from learning. So we do um, Ghanaian tree, Ethiopian Amharic, Wolof, Yoruba, soon for Kiswahili. I have my Igbo teacher and it's been going really, really well. Partly, I also do books. So this comes on the Nubian diary. Obele means the way forward. And so some my scarves and material. So it's really a great day to be doing my promotion as well. So if you need any more information on the African languages, um, I'm setting up an academy. So I love the support. It's the email is African A F R I C A N language classes at gmail.com. And if you're interested in the books, it's Nubian Diary, N U B I A N D I A R Y O B E L E U B E L E at gmail.com. And the telephone number is 079-133-7054. Yeah, hi everybody. Greetings, family. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm Omar Wali and I'm really trying to uh, specialize in the um, alkaline water. Uh, what's so special about it? Um, basically, it's a um, medical machine from Japan. Um, which is a standard issue in most of the um, hospitals in Japan. Uh, why it's so good? Because it does from 2.5 to 11.5 pH. 11.5 pH being for people who've got cancer and for you know people who are trying to sort of uh, get their health together. They'll start on sort of 8 pH and gradually work their way up to 8.5, then 9 and 9.5. So this is very, very good water. It's used by people in the um, sports field. Uh, 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 detoxes your body, um, cleans your colon, um, eventually gives you a lot of energy um, and, and gradually balances the uh, pH of your body. Um, my name is Omar Wali and I can be reached or contacted on 0746-384-8550 and um, I also do home deliveries. So for anyone who's sort of interested in the water, uh, that would be really lovely. Hello, my name is Noreen Stewart. Uh, you can contact me at www.noreenstewart.com. Um, I'm actually a musician and this is a sideline where I make a reusable sanitary towel. Yes, reusable sanitary towels. Uh, scarves, just like the wonderful scarf I'm wearing. Lavender eye patches, great for stress relief. Uh, books. Uh, Hairbands, uh, purses, leather and fabric, hair scrunchies and all that lovely stuff. All handcrafted by moi. Greetings everybody, um, blessed evenings to you. My name is Sister Malika and um, I am called www.sweenmorocco.com Everything that I've purchased and sell is all from Morocco and um, when I go to Morocco I tend to buy most of my things from local small sellers. I, I don't go to the big major stores. I like to support the local people and that's the people that I buy from. Um, most of my products, you can get my stuff as I said on www.zweenmorocco.com um, Everything's Moroccan and most of it is ceramics. If there's anything there, there's a number on my card as well. If you want anything, just give me a call or email me and I'll get right back to you. Um, love of Morocco has always been there for me. It's North Africa and I love Africa. Blessings. Okay, we are at the Resurrecting Wall Street. We are over in North London. As you can hear the audience in the background, it was absolutely full house in there today. People came out to learn economics and study economics and see the uh, screen of the resurrecting Black Wall Street. Now, economics is a very key component of uh, our liberation as a people. So we're here to speak with uh, one of the young men who came and watched the screening. How did you find the um, documentary? Um, I think it was really good. Um, a lot of it I've been looking up and reading up on myself as well. 
everything that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the main thing highlighting it is the power of the consumer. I think a lot of black people, we need to resonate in the fact that we actually hold the power in how we spend our money, how we use our money. And us giving outside of our community, we're taking away some of that power from our own community. So resurrecting it me is an excellent thing because we're now bringing that power back to ourselves. And that's one of the main things I was trying to project in today. And I think that's what a lot of people have left feeling and wanting to look forward to. In regards to those feelings, what does it mean for yourself? How would you, how would your, I mean, was you already very astute this way or have you learned something today which you're going to start applying in your life? For me personally, um, it's something I've been a suit myself for a long time. I mean, I set up a young charity 13 years ago to help young black children in my local area. Um, it's something that I do all the time in myself consciously and try and encourage more with some of the young people I come across personally. But um, in terms of going forward, it's, I think the main thing really is to ignite that thought, to ignite that think way of thinking. And I think a lot of people who may not even been thinking about it before are now going to start thinking about it. And I think that's the main thing really. And just very, very briefly, in regards to your charity, do you want to give a little bit of information so that people can maybe support you, maybe support financially, because that's what most charities need to carry on with their great work. So would you like to give a bit of information yeah, in regards sure. to charity? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I set up, a, I'm one of the co-founders of a charity called SC1 United, which is based, based in Waterloo. And the main foundations and ethos of that charity is that it's led by young people. That's why it's lasted for 13 years. That's why there's so many people that still keep funding us to keep going. And the main thing we do is we provide resources for young people that they cannot get else, elsewhere or through their own social economic background. So this is through either education, employment or creative arts. We handle all those three areas. And um, I mainly handle the finance sector, that's what I mainly do. But um, yeah, so SC1 United, literally just Google the name and you can see a lot of the work that we do and a lot of the young people that we reach. So economics isn't just about the money where it plays an important part but there's other ways that we can support uh, organizations and groups of people working in our community which is you know all part of the same ethos and that ethos is supporting self and kind so it's very important you get involved in that. i'd like to thank you for your time and um, yeah we're going to keep it moving and interview uh, some other people um, on here exclusively on gk tv thank you very much once again we found another young man who was uh, engaged in watching the screening of Resurrecting Black Wall Street, which we at JKTV are down here today exclusively. So we're going to find out, um, how did you find the documentary? Was it inspiring? Oh, very inspiring. I found it very informative because I kind of had a bit of a background knowledge on, do you know what I mean, Tulsa and how uh, everything was run. But now, like after watching that documentary, I definitely have a better understanding. Yeah. And how, how would this affect your life going forward? Because obviously the documentary makers who are making these documentaries are trying to have an impact. Not just trying to make documentaries to raise funds, which is very important, but also to have impact in people's lives so they start making a difference in their communities. How would it make a difference for yourself? Do you know what? For me personally, I think knowing your history and knowing what they went through and seeing what they achieved, it, like the lady said in there, it gives you hope. So you know that you can do it yourself. So I want to try and network with more people, talk to more people, hopefully bring some of my friends down to the show as well. Because I know they've got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of community schemes that they were talking about, a lot of events on. And for me, I'm from South London and this is in North, but it's not far for me. Do you know what I mean? It's not a far drive. I want to get more people involved and just get people thinking more about what they can do to move forward, especially within the black community. Okay, so um, looks like another satisfied person and you know, obviously the video in itself is making an impact because it's encouraging people to do something after watching it, which is the whole um, purpose of why a documentary maker makes a documentary. So I'd like to thank you. Um, as you said, you're going to spread the word, let people know exactly what's going on. So great. Any last words to anybody watching in regards to um, you know, financial accountability? I would just say, don't think that you can't achieve things. I'd say always open your mind out to things and always try and network and talk to other people. Uh, don't be afraid to talk to others. I know it can be a daunting task in terms of people might think that they can't achieve certain things, but like you said, our ancestors before us managed to do great things with 
like they didn't have the fact of social media and all of these platforms and they still manage greatness so I think we just need to encourage people to step out and just be brave. Yo, it's Swiss. My name is JJ Bola. This is Shakara. Hi, sister. My name is Empress Mani. What's up? It's the world changer, Michele Mean. You're locked onto Got Kush. Got Kush. Got Kush. Got Kush TV, the conscious platform for all conscious people. Stay tuned. There was, there was, there was, there was empires in Africa called Kush Timbuktu where every race came to get books For my success to you, even if you wish me the opposite Sooner or later we'll all see who the prophet is